Welcome, everybody, to Chemistry Semester 2. We are going to jump right into it. Um, if you guys, uh, all of you aren't new, but just to remind you all that we are in um, the second semester, so make sure when you're on your Canvas dashboard, you're checking the second semester um, for announcements or for all that kind of stuff. Um, everything's exactly the same. Announcements have announcements in them. Uh, the assignments section is one place to look for assignments if you want to just see what you're supposed to do and not see all the um, resources for those things. Um, and then, you know, we're not doing discussions. Your grades will be up on here. Um, it might, okay, good. It doesn't show as don't show you, which is all very annoying <laughs> that it has that option. Just be like, don't show them their grades, but that is off. So you should see your grade update as time goes on. Um, syllabus is up. So uh, you can review that. It has my contact information on it. Obviously you can just contact me through Canvas, but there's my phone number if you need something urgent and I'm not answering your message because I'm out and about. Um, and then you can see on the syllabus, it shows like what days we're, we're here, um, what we're doing. And then down here it has like the week of, uh, and then I put a general calendar of what's going on. So like you can see today, it says chapter 13, it has the assignment quiz on there. And then when I um, put the other stuff in and we'll say what we're doing that day and what assignments are due that day and whatnot. So we do have final exam for this one because we do have the kind of sporadic, um, uh, we have the reduced chapter amount in the second semester. So that's good. So the syllabus is there if you want to look at it. And then of course, quizzes will be where the exams are, even though that program is terrible, but hey, it'll work. Um, yeah. So today we're talking about chapter 13. If you're ever wondering like, you know, this is, you know, I didn't use your book before this and my resources are based, you know, on other stuff. And you're like, I don't really know what, you know, which resource to click on. You can obviously just go to this. If you want to follow along directly to the book and it tells you exactly what's in each section. Um, and if you really just want to sum it up, you can just click on the one that's just the section review. And it's like, okay, well, then what's a gas pressure, all that kind of stuff. And then what's a liquid, what's a solid. And then we talk about you know, states of matter. So that's, you know, this is all we're talking about today. So any video or any notes that are on this, uh, you know, we're going to get into it. So, um, so yeah, very short today because everything's pretty quick and easy to talk about. Um, some of the things we're not going to talk about, like pretty much crystals, we're just not going to get into crystals at all. So you ignore that completely. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about phase diagrams, but not that much. Mostly we're just gonna talk about pressure and um, intermolecular forces and um, phase diagrams. And that's about it, it won't take very long. So anyway, you can check that out in the modules um, when it says classwork. Now, speaking of assignments, when you see here, you basically automatically get these points for the classwork. These are the um, worksheets I just showed you that um, help you work through the textbook if you are reading the textbook or if you're interested in like what we will be talking about, you can work through those. They are more detailed than they than we will be covering because sometimes we don't cover certain things like crystals. We're not gonna really get into crystals at all. Um, last unit, there was stuff about um, metals and we only had like one question on a metal like what is a metal so um, that is uh, what those are so they're worth a point each but you just you get that point automatically for just being in class 
so you don't have to tell anything about that. And then remember, you have your quizzes, your daily attendance quiz, or sometimes it's an assignment. We only had one assignment last time. Um, I probably will just stick to the quizzes because um, looking at um, the logistics of making an actual physical assignment, many of you guys had issues with that because of internet, printers, whatever. Um, this way, it's very easy for you to just go to a website and fill something out um, so you can get your credit. And then, of course, that, you know, it's quizzes, so it's, you know, big and colorful and fun. So <clears throat> that's 35% of your grade. Make sure you're doing those on the day they're assigned so I can take attendance for that. And then, of course, we have the exams. 60% of your grade are exams. And those pop up and you take them. And you guys did great on those most of the time. So it's usually some typos and questions or, you know, um, it has a weird thing if I hit the uh, randomize the answers. Uh, sometimes it will double them up or sometimes it will just remove one of the important answers. So that's fun. <coughs> anyway. Okay, so let's get into it let's just jump right into it so we are going to be talking about the states of matter for this um chapter and looking at on a molecular level uh what makes the states of matter the states of matter That admit oh come on come on man all right <sighs> is my internet connection slow I don't need this PowerPoint if it's not gonna load there we go all right didn't really want to load okay so um we'll get into gases in a second but basically um, when we're talking about the states of matter, we want to think about on terms of, on the molecular level, what exactly is happening to make something a solid, a liquid, or a gas, okay? Um, and so we're not going to spend too much time on solids and liquids, and we're going to spend most of our time on gases today and pressure. But I just want to talk very briefly about what makes things a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So let's just review real quick, like what's a solid? So a solid, as you guys learned before, was, you know, um, what we call definite shape. Which means solids have a shape. Okay. And that is their shape. They hold their shape. If they're a square, they're a square. I mean, a cube or whatever. All right. Anyway. Um, and that shape will take up a space. So they have a definite volume. So if you take a like a marble and you put it in a beaker, it doesn't fill it doesn't you know fill the bottom of the beaker, it just stays a marble, right? So solids have definite shape and definite volume. So what is actually happening though at the molecular level? And the answer is that the molecules are in a rigid organization meaning they're all touching in some way and that they're organized in such a way that makes it some sort of organized arrangement here. So we get this kind of like, if say we're talking about a salt crystal, we would have, you know, a rigid box. So all are touching. Um, they may not all be touching each other, but they're all touching some of the other molecules. And it's a rigid arrangement. Uh, 
And now we're going to add something. We're going to say their kinetic energy, because what we're going to talk about today about the different types of solid, liquid, and gas, the phases of matter, is all about how much kinetic energy they have. E R G Y. So kinetic energy of solids is usually low or lower. Okay. <clears throat> so that is a solid. So then what's a liquid? Well, again, the old type of definition was you had um, indefinite shape. So it took the shape of its container. but it had a definite volume. So it, different, it didn't let you change its volume. <clears throat> so what was happening here? Well, if we look at like a glass of water, the water molecules are in here and they're all just kind of bumping into each other and bowling around in there, but they're able to move around. And so able to move. And, but again, still touching. All the molecules are touching each other. In terms of the kinetic energy, kinetic means movement. So of course, if they're able to move, their kinetic energy is higher. And then finally, gases have both indefinite um, shape and volume. So a gas will take the shape of its container and the volume of its container. And the reason why is if we look at PowerPoint, you can see um, they're just kind of bouncing around in here. They're a little ball that's bouncing around. And um, we used this in a previous <clears throat> uh, discussion where we talked about uh, gases and what they look like. You can use these um, PHET simulations to help you out. Take a look at this stuff. They used to be Flash and Java, um, but it looks like they're trying to move them all to uh, HTML5 which is good because Java sucks and Flash is dead. So there you go. <laughs> uh, there we go. Boop. Gas properties. I have a very slow computer today. We'll come back to that. So anyway, the gas particles are able to bounce around inside their container. So we'd have to put a lid on it, but then this little ball can just kind of bounce around everywhere and completely take up the whole shape of its whole container. Um, and then when it bumps into other uh, substances, we have, so lots of movement, right? And instead of all of the molecules custom, touching, we have what's called elastic collisions. And what is an elastic collision? An elastic collision is, if it's just ready to go, there we go. An elastic collision is, you'll notice that when these balls bump into each other, it doesn't slow them down. This is what's called an elastic collision. So if you've ever been in bumper cars, when you slam into somebody in the bumper car, both of your cars kind of stop. You lose momentum because you're transferring your energy to each other. That's what's called an inelastic collision. But for the sake of gases, they bounce off each other and they don't lose their energy. So we have what is called an elastic collision. And so gases fill the shape and the volume of their container because they're constantly undergoing these 
elastic collisions where they bump into each other and don't interact. So when it comes in terms of the kinetic energy, which is Ke here, it is high. Because they have such high kinetic energy, they're able to bounce around. So if you want to follow your book around, then they're going to get into different types of solids, crystalline solids, amorphous solids. Um, we don't need to really get into that. I just need you to know that when it comes to their kinetic energy, the molecules do have kinetic energy. They're kind of sitting there and fidgeting in their seats, but it's not as high as the liquid kinetic energy and the gas kinetic energy. So in terms of the amount of energy it takes to be that state of matter, solid requires the least amount of energy for a substance to be in that state. Liquid requires more. And gas requires more as well. So what this leads us to is then, okay, what causes these things to want to stick to each other, to want to be in the solid state, the liquid state, or the gaseous state? And this is something called intermolecular forces. So the amount of intermolecular forces is going to determine how, what state of matter you're going to be in at a particular temperature. So we're just going to assume we're talking about just regular room temperature on Earth. If you have high intermolecular forces versus low intermolecular forces or the different type of intermolecular forces you have, that'll make you a solid, a liquid, or a gas. So let's talk about the different types of intermolecular forces. The most important one is called hydrogen bonding. This is the most important one because this is the reason why we exist. This is the reason why life exists. Hydrogen, when it's interacting with a, another highly electronegative element, so HN, HO, or HF, Because of the large polarity difference between H and this element, but not so large that it results in ionic, this becomes a very polar bond. And because it is very polar, the hydrogen bond, and the most important hydrogen bond is really kind of HO, is going to basically behave as if this was a permanent kind of what we call positive over here and negative over here. So every molecule that has the OH in it has a piece of a little magnet on it. So it's kind of like um, on a drawer, right? If you have like your um, drawer here and it's held together by little magnets that close the drawer, well, when you go to close it, these two things are gonna to stick to each other on the door and on the cabinet because that's a little spot where there is um, a magnet piece. And so if you look at a molecule, like say for instance, vinegar, vinegar looks very much like any other, um, sorry, my computer is lagging today. No, don't clear the whole thing. Just want the eraser, thank you. Okay, so vinegar starts to look like any other large hydrocarbon with not any um, hydrogen bonding. But when you go over here, you'll notice that we get an OH. And so this portion of the molecule out here has a positive and a negative. And so there's a little magnet. And this little spot on the molecule right here allows vinegar to want to dissolve in water. Whereas this part over here is going to make it want to not dissolve in water, but because of this out here, vinegar becomes very soluble. This hydrogen bonding intermolecular force is the strongest intermolecular force. If you have a molecule that contains H 
O or HN because there's only one molecule that contains HF and that's HF. But if you have a molecule that has HO or HN bonds, it can undergo hydrogen bonding and it will contain very, very strong hydrogen bonds, uh, very, very strong intermolecular forces. So of course, what's the best example of this? Water. Water is bent because of its uh, Vesper theory model that says those two valence shell electron pairs will bend our um, molecule. But also, because of our hydrogen bonding, we have this thing acting like a little magnet. So we have positive ends over here, negative end over there. And so now, water molecule is a basically a gi big giant ball of hydrogen bonding potential. And that is why water has a boiling point of 100 degrees C because of its extremely hard, large amount of hydrogen bonding. If we look at its molar mass, which is 18 grams per mole, if we compare that to something that doesn't undergo hydrogen bonding, methane at 16 grams per mole, only slightly lighter, this thing has a boiling point of negative something degrees. I can't even remember it off the top of my head. It's like negative, I think uh, for methane, it's like negative 100. We'll just call it negative 100 degrees. So there's a 200 degree difference in the boiling point, And that is the difference between hydrogen bonding and no hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. If you have hydrogen bonding, you will be um, a solid or a liquid. In the case of water, you're a liquid, but in other instances, you can be uh, solid, depending on the substance. Uh, might have to close this because it's really killing my computer. All right. This is just a Surface Pro, I think one, so it's, uh, it's a little laggy. All right, so then we have dipole, dipole, or just dipole forces. You can call them dipole, dipole. It's up to you. And dipole, dipole is just every other polar bond or polar molecule um, that just aren't, that, that aren't ADEP. So a good example of this is if we looked at the vinegar again, right here is a hydrogen bond. So that's an H bond. But right here we have a um, electronegativity difference that is polar. So right here we have, you know, the negative charge right here and the positive charge right here. So this is not as strong as a polarity difference as the OH is. And so this right here would be a dipole-dipole bond when it's going to interact with something. So we have an H bond over here. We have a dipole-dipole bond right there. Um, so a good example of this is uh, like phosphorus and um, chlorine. Um, chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus, just barely enough to create polarity bonds. And so because of its shape, it'll be polar our negatives will be down here, and so that'll undergo a dipole-dipole bond. Now, you guys don't have to worry about, um, you know, being able to determine the polarity of a molecule and be able to tell me if it's dipole-dipole or anything like that. I just want you to understand, like, what is causing these things to be the different uh, forces. So these are the second weakest, but they're kind of the most common um, for polar substances. The most common is going to be the next type of interaction because a lot, everything can undergo the next kind of reaction. Or the next kind of intermolecular force. <clears throat> so 
So if you are a molecule and you're thinking about being a solid, liquid, or gas, at room temperature, everything has the same kinetic energy because it's all room temperature. So then are you going to stick to each other to make a solid? Are you gonna to stick to each other to make a liquid? Or are you gonna make a gas? So if you don't have any intermolecular forces, you're gonna be a gas. That's what we're talking about this. But if you have some, you might be a liquid or you might be a solid. So that, the last one is what's called London dispersion forces. or L LDF. Um, they're also called van der Waals. I don't know if it's, is it, I'll just call that van der Waals. So van der Waals. And basically what happens if you think of a molecule as this kind of big nebulous kind of blob of positive and negative stuff. Well, when it's moving and it runs into and bumps into another blob of stuff that's kind of positive or negative. Negatives don't like each other. And so the negatives will kind of push each other out of the way. And so what we'll get is this kind of large area of negative out here and this area of positive out here. And so they, um, because of the larger molecules, being able to kind of smoosh each other's um, electron clouds to kind of interact, we get this kind of region where we have kind of a temporary dipole. And that's why it's called London dispersion forces because they are bumping into each other and they're dispersing each other's negative charge. So London dispersion forces are basically the, the intermolecular force that almost anything has um, but basically, if you're not polar, all you can do is London dispersion forces. So if we look at um, different hydrocarbons, you can really see London dispersion forces in action. So if we take a look at methane as CH4, and I'll just do it like this. There is no polarity here. And it's a very, very light molecule. So when it bumps into other molecules, it doesn't have a lot of force to do dispersion. And so there's very, very little intermolecular force, if at all. If we then go to ethane, ethane has a, um, a lower boiling point than methane because it's a little bit larger. So therefore it has a little bit more London dispersion forces. Propane is a little bit larger. And now where these two gases are stored as gases, propane, we can start smashing down into storing it as a liquid. And so whenever you buy a propane tank for your barbecue, it is in a liquid form inside the tank. And that is because it has increased LDF. Then butane is what's in lighters, and you can see that it's a liquid inside the lighter. But you'll notice that the lighter can be made of something like plastic. So it's much easier for it to be turned into a liquid. And then we have heptane, or sorry, uh, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane. And these guys are all, we'll just say C5 to C10. These guys are all going to be liquids at room temperature. So in the C5 to C10 range, this is usually stuff that's inside gasoline or any other, other type of uh, um, that type of solvent is going to look like that. And then we start to get into the C probably 16 plus we start looking at oils and then we can start to get into the solids, which are the C kind of 24 ish. Depends on the, uh, what else is going on on the molecule. We start getting into things like butters and stuff like that, where it's kind of that amorphous solid. So as you can see the size of the molecule, we have, increased Lund or intermolecular forces, we have increased London dispersion forces. And so the boiling point starts to go down and down and down and down 
until we start to get the liquids and then it seeps going down and down and down until we get solids and gas. So, sorry, boiling point, uh, yeah, going up. Sorry, boiling point going up because we're having more and more forces. Um, so yeah, that's London dispersion forces. So, what if you don't have any intermolecular forces? Barely any. Well, then you're gonna be a gas. And that's what gives us the properties of the gases. So, all I want you to know about solids and liquids is that solids, the usual stuff, definite shape, definite volume, but their kinetic energy is, you know, based on their temperature, but their individual molecules are going to be interacting in some way, and so usually, if you have low kinetic energy, you're going to be a solid. If you have more kinetic energy, you're going to switch over to being a liquid because you're able to move around, but you're still going to be physically interacting. Those physical interactions are going to mean increased intermolecular forces. Now that could be more London dispersion forces, or it could be starting to look at things like dipole or um, hydrogen bonding. A great example of this is um, acetone. Acetone is um, like this. Acetone is what we call a ketone, where we have, it looks almost like um, uh, vinegar, where over here would have been uh, OH. So we just have these nonpolar regions right here, which make acetone great at wanting to dissolve things that are not polar. So it has a lot of London dispersion forces, but why is it a liquid and not a gas if it doesn't really have a lot of for forces? And the answer is right here, we have a dipole bond. So we do have our negative positive dipole right here, and we do have our LDF right here. So even though we have low intermolecular forces with LDF, we do have a dipole, and so this goes from being a gas into a liquid, and then it's also really good at dissolving in both um, oil and water. Good stuff. <clears throat> so talking about gases then, Gases are basically, you can think of them as tiny little balls and they're bouncing around and they have a lot of kinetic energy, but they don't have a lot of intermolecular forces. Basically almost no LDF because they're small. And if they do have polar molecules, well then they're gonna wanna stick to each other and they're not gonna be a gas. So they usually don't have a lot of um, dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding bonds. So, um, this gives us the kinetic molecular theory of gases, that they are little balls that are constantly moving around in random motion. And so basically, if we're going to go from a solid liquid to a gas, and we do have intramolecular forces, we need to overcome those intramolecular forces by increasing kinetic energy. So for instance, butter is a solid at room temperature because of the LDF forces. But if we start to heat it up, it melts very quickly because LDF forces are easy to break. But um, we still need to heat it up a little bit more and then you can start to get the butter to turn into a gas. Now butter is a bad example because butter tends to burn before this happens. Same thing with sugar. You can melt sugar but then once you try and melt it, it doesn't tend to evaporate or try to vaporize because it tends to just start reacting with itself and become or oxygen in the air and become carbon dioxide and water. But a good example of this is mercury. Mercury is a metal and it is a liquid at room temperature um, because of its interesting um, electron configuration. And then when you start to heat it up, it will evaporate. And that's one of the more dangerous aspects of mercury. So what this is going to do is it's going to give um, in physical properties to gases that are unique to gases um, 
like something called diffusion and effusion, and then um, compressibility. So when you think about a solid or a liquid and you try and smash them, they can't really be compressed very much. They aren't very good molecular springs. And um, um, yeah, they are very good springs. Some of them might have some springiness in their molecule, but when it comes to um, gases, they have tons of space in between them and so you can compress them. So we're gonna be talking about that. And then of course their density is very low and they move like fluids. So when we talk about diffusion and effusion being kind of unique to gases, it does happen a little bit in liquids. Um, what is diffusion? Diffusion basically means that the particles will just start to randomly distribute themselves throughout. So if we go to our little simulation, which got closed. There we go. Just give me explore. There we go. If we look at our gases, um, you can see that it's going to expand, but you'll notice is that it, it's going to diffuse. So and what that means is it's going to distribute itself evenly throughout the container. Now, if we add a different gas, we can watch that diffusion occur. There's a little spray of that gas and you'll notice, but because these molecules are smaller, they're moving faster. And so they're able to diffuse very quickly through the substance and then evenly distribute themselves. So if we start off with the heavy or with the light gas, you'll notice it diffuses very quickly. It fills up its container. The molecules are moving very quickly because they all have the same kinetic energy. But the heavier gas, it's going to be released very quickly in that part of the room. And then slowly everyone in the room will start to notice that gas until that gas is now evenly distributed throughout the room giving credence to the, um, if you're smelling it, it's probably in that particular area. Now, what is effusion? Well, effusion, which had a cool demonstration for it. Oh, it just has diffusion. Um, here's another example of it. And then watch what happens when we move the divider. You'll see that the um, red gases will diffuse quicker than the blue ones until eventually everything is distributed evenly. So, anyway, so what is effusion? Effusion is for the basically when you get a pop tire, and that is uh, gases will try and force them their way out of tiny. Um, uh, little holes and uh, if they are the size of that hole or smaller they will definitely fit through there and try and force their way out. This will increase um, the rate of diffusion to the outside of that particular container. So that's why your tire will go flat. So we already talked about kinetic molecular theory. It's the theory that the amount of movement you have is what um, state of matter you are. <clears throat> so when it comes to then talking about gases, one of the most important things to talk about in terms of gases is their pressure. So pressure, as you can see, is force over an area. Okay, so this is why the bed of nails work is because if you try and step on a nail, you're putting all of that force onto a small point. And so the area is small and the force is large, so it easily punctures you. This is why needles, um, when you get an injection, are really small and sharp. But if you lay them out, you're distributing that force over a greater area. And so the pressure goes down. talk about that in a second. 
So what's happening inside of a gas? So if we add some gas, you'll notice that as soon as the ball starts to bounce off the walls, you can start to see that the gases start exerting a pressure. And so what we call pressure is the kinetic energy in the ball, so the force of the ball hitting the area of the box. And they're bouncing off. So if we change the area that the things are bouncing around in, you'll notice that our pressure goes up because now we have lower area, but the same amount of force. And so our pressure increases. What we can also do is we can add more force by pumping in more gas. And we can see that we're having um, increased pressure. And then of course, if we increase our area, like with the bed of nails, the force will go down. And you can see we went from 18 down to seven. So pressure then is going to be measured, okay, for gases. As one of the ways to kind of be able to physically describe a gas, its pressure is very important. The reason why it's not so important for solids and liquids is because they are already kind of interacting with themselves and their force is just the force due to gravity. So they're universal in their forces. Well, with gases, because they are have um, so much kinetic energy and because they're not bumping into each other, sometimes they can be buoyant and the force due to gravity becomes less of a issue. So we have to talk about their individual pressures. And so we're gonna get into how to measure pressure. On the screen right now are the metric versions of pressure, pascals, uh, millimeters of mercury, and atmospheres. Those are the metric units. Um, we also use PSI in, uh, in America. And you might also hear bar. And bar is just the conversion from millimeters of mercury into inches of mercury. And um, you might see that on like the weather um, website. It might say inches of mercury or it might say bar. Um, but that is basically just the you know, standard conversion of this unit. Um, and uh, PSI is kind of the standard conversion of Pascal. Um, we're not going to get into that. We're going to use mostly this thing called atmosphere. And the atmosphere is the pressure due to the air at sea level. Okay. So when it comes to units of pressure, they all have what we call equivalencies. We use our standard pressure um, measurement as what we call one atmosphere. So what is an atmosphere? So if you are on the earth, okay, let's draw a big earth, and you are standing over here in the ocean, you are at sea level, meaning um, sea level was established back in the day because they thought the ocean's level was the same everywhere. Now it turns out that's not true because of you know the earth not being a perfect ball, it's kind of an oval and the way gravity works but it's not that big of a difference. But if we look at the atmosphere as being like the upper atmosphere being up here, the amount of air that's between you and up here, that amount of air is what's causing the pressure. So then if you go up to, you know, some part, um, Claremont is about 700 feet off the ground, you'll notice that there is less air between you and the upper atmosphere, and so therefore the pressure goes down a little bit. And then if you're at the top of a mountain, there is less air even still. And so that's why we say one atmosphere is the pressure at sea level, because that is going to be kind of the most, the majority of the planet should have about that pressure. And so our equivalencies there is 
one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury is annoying to say, so they also just called it Tor. So you might see Tor sometimes. And then, because we're talking about force over an area, we have Pascals. Pascals are Newton meters, and they're extremely small, so we tend to use kilo Pascals. And then, of course, since we're Americans, we want to learn about PSI, so pounds per square inch. So a pound per square inch, the atmosphere is 14.7 PSI. So what does that mean? It means every square inch of your body, when you're standing on the sea level, has 14.7 pounds of air on, sitting on top of it. And then when you go up to, you know, a high altitude, humans usually don't, um, they start to tend to start to get altitude sickness at about 6,000 feet. But say you went up to like Lake Tahoe, which is normally around 8,000 feet. Well, then you're looking at having only about 12 pounds on you. Twelve PSI. And then as you can see, the Pascal is um, just a thousand times bigger than the kilo Pascal. Okay. <clears throat> so those are our metric conversions. And I recommend you guys, you know, write those down somewhere so that you know those equivalences so you don't have to keep doing those. So let's talk really quick about the history of measuring pressure and then we'll do a few conversions because the conversions are really easy. If you guys just come out of doing um, uh, stoichiometry, then metric conversions are going to be super easy. So the first thing is they first started measuring pressure using what's called a barometer. Now, a barometer is this picture right here, but as you can see, that picture is not rendering very well. So we're going to attempt to draw it right here. And then I'll look it up on the internet. So basically, if you have a pool of any liquid and you take a cup boop, 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 and you submerge it, so the cup is completely full of the liquid, if you turn the cup upside down, but you don't let the bottom of the cup uh, leave the surface of the liquid, the air pressure is going to be pushing down on the liquid, which means that the liquid inside of this container is still going to be affected by the force due to gravity. It's going to try and want to come out, but this air pressure is going to push it back in. And so the liquid is going to stay inside of the cup. So the question is then, can you make a cup where there is so much liquid inside of the container that eventually the force due to gravity can overcome the air pressure. And so this is a barometer. You have a pool. I'll draw a better barometer. You have some sort of pool of liquid. And then you have an upside down cup. And inside that cup is the liquid. The air pressure then is pushing down on the liquid and the liquid inside the tube is pushing down trying to get out of the tube because of gravity. The more liquid you have in the tube, the larger the force of gravity. And so when they overcome each other, instead of this tube being filled up completely, it will create a vacuum. Now, the easiest barometer for you guys to do, if you wanted to do this at home, would to be use water. But the problem is to make a barometer out of water, say this was water inside of here, this column would have to be 30 meters tall. Or sorry, 10 meters, 30 feet. It'd have to be 10 meters, so about 31 feet. 32 feet. And so it's, do you have a 30 foot, two foot tall cup? Well, no, but you might have a tube. You can try this with a tube if you have a 30-ish um, foot tube and maybe a, a tall house uh, that you can get up 
you know, 30 feet off the ground. But most of us have been seeing a story home. So making a barometer at home is kind of impossible. So what did they make barometers about back in the 1600s? They made them out of mercury. Molar mass of water is 18 grams per mole. And the molar mass of mercury is 207, I believe. We'll just say 200. <laughs> so as you can see, we're looking at, you know, 10 times greater. So the column they set up was a one meter column. And so otherwise known as a thousand millimeters. And so mercury at standard atmosphere pressure, so one atmosphere, the mercury would, instead of being at the top, it would sink to 760 millimeters. And that's where millimeters of mercury comes in. The barometers, uh, the force due to gravity on the mercury is able to overcome the force of the air pressure on the top of the mercury bath for only 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters. After which point it will create a vacuum up here. UUM. <clears throat> this is how a straw works, by the way. If you're trying to drink your drink, you have your drink right here, you got your lid and you have a straw. What you're doing is you're creating low pressure when you put your mouth on the straw, you're creating low pressure in here and the air pressure is constant on the top of your drink. So when there's low pressure, your drink is able to push your liquid up your straw. If you wanna see this in action, you can, if you wanna try this at home, if you have straws, then you take a drink and you put a straw in it and you drink from right here, put another straw in it that you don't drink from and you'll notice that you cannot drink from this straw very well because you are creating low pressure, but um, the straw doesn't, uh, sorry, you have to put, ugh. I'm a terrible artist. Okay, do, 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 do. You put one straw in the liquid, one straw out of the liquid, suck on both of them. You'll notice you can't suck through the straw very well. Try it at home, it's fun. Maybe you've done it already at a restaurant. So that's a barometer. Another way to do a barometer is to use a um, coiled spring. And you're using the, um, the fact that um, metals expand and contract in heat um, to make the spring expand and contract. And what this will do is it will push the spring in and out and then that change in the, the length of the spring can be measured as the barometer um, because heat and pressure are related, as we'll talk about later. So then we have what's called a mammometer, which is just a U-shaped. So instead of having a bath, you have a U-shaped mammometer. And then if you pressurize one side, the stuff will go up the tube. And then you can see the difference between those as your pressure. So we're not going to get into that. We wanted to talk about um, pressure conversions. So let's write our equivalences out. So if we have one ATM, one ATM is equal to 760 mmHg, which is also called 760 Tor because mmHg is a pain in the butt to say. This also equals 101, 300 Pascals. A Pascal is a Newton over a meter, um, but you know you guys don't know Newtons yet, so we just call it Pascals. And then because Pascals are tiny, we tend to use kilo Pascals. And then we have um, PSI, 14.1, 14.7 PSI. So when it comes to conversions, all you're going to do is just use one of these conversions. So if the question says you have seven ATM, 
what does that equal in MMHG? Well, you're just going to use this equivalent. So you're just going to say seven ATM and you're going to go for every one ATM, there's 760 MMHG. So you're just going to multiply those two together. Or if they say you have, you know, 207,400 Pascals, well, what is that in PSI? Well, you'll just do this, 207, 400 PA, and then you're just going to go to your list. There's PA, there's PSI, and you're going to say 101, 300 PA to 14.7 PSI. That's it. That's all there is to it from one conversion to another. And then how would you solve this problem? Well, if you're just going to multiply this one and ignore that, then you're just going to multiply and then you're going to divide. So seven atmospheres is five thousand three hundred and twenty I think it said where'd my bar go we're having a hard time today computer yeah um, MMHG or Tor and then down here what's the answer to this thing so we would just 207 400 and then we would times that by 14.7 and we would divide it by 101, 300, 30.1. And that's all there is to it. Now, why do we have to do that is because, you know, sometimes the tool you need to measure the pressure can be a pressure gauge. And so you might see Pascal's or you might see PSI, or it might be um, talking about you know, atmospheric pressure. And so how do you measure atmospheric pressure? Well, you might be looking at using a barometer and that might come in the form of millimeters of mercury. Um, you can obviously do the conversion if you want to know inches of mercury. Um, we have millimeters of mercury. Well, if we want to know millimeters to uh, inches, we have to go from millimeters to centimeters first. For every 10 of these, there's one of those. And then for every 2.54 centimeters, there's one inch. So this divided by 10 divided by 2.54. So if you guys want that measurement, 29.92. So another way, if you want MMHG, you can also do 29.92 inches of mercury which is called bar. <clears throat> so those are the pressure measurements. All right. And that's it for chapter 13. Since we're not going to cover most of the stuff, I just wanted to kind of get, get into, you know, those things, the very basic math problems. What is pressure? What is a gas? What are the forces? So you should find this chapter today pretty easy.